is Brian Rowe with Mythic MTG Tech number 302, looking at the July speculation and investment video. Things have been crazy here in Magic Finance world. I could be doing a video almost every day on all the weird stuff that's going on. We're going to jump in though and talk about a lot of things on the reserve list, a little bit of stuff in standard, and some more general finance tips for where you should be looking for value right now. I'm going to be out at Gen Con. If you're at Gen Con, please stop, say hi. I'm going to have a limited number of angel tokens available. Just let me know that you watch the channel. You can have an angel token. Look forward to seeing people out there. I'm going to be playing some vintage. I'm working on a vintage deck tech to get out before I head out there. Ooh, legacy. Things are getting really shook up. One of the big announcements that's a little bit on the depressing side is that Bazaar of Moxen is going to be cutting back their legacy offerings. This is kind of the equivalent of what SCG did last year in saying that larger legacy tournaments are not drawing in the numbers that they really had hoped for. Does this mean the death of Legacy? No. Legacy has this really strong community around it, but it also shows that Legacy is getting really expensive and it's not the growing format that Modern is or that Standard is or that Drafts continue to be. So we're still going to see some events from Bizarre of Moxen. I do not see this negatively impacting the price of Legacy cards, but it does show you the trend of where things are going. And cards are valuable because they are played. Having less big tournaments out there does hurt a little bit. It does give an opportunity for more regional or smaller stores to step in there. Not doom and gloom, but not very happy news for legacy players. We have also been through some crazy stuff with prices recently, including buyouts, major finance, idiots jumping in from other areas. We've got things going on here that we haven't seen in the past. And TCG player has stepped up because they're kind of at the center of this controversy, saying that they don't like the price manipulation themselves, which is an interesting and very positive spin from them because they have a lot to gain by being the current inquest or the current scry or the current price guide. And they're taking three different steps to try to show people that they're working on showing accurate pricing. The first one that they're doing right here is they made some changes to the way pricing data is done. And the primary pricing data that you're going to see is going to be based off of recent sales, not just a crazy offer to sell price that nobody is actually cashing in on. That is a good thing. There's a brand new tool that's coming out with regards to buy list items, and they're working on improving this stuff. And that's the big thing that I'm going to be talking about today. I was led into the beta this last weekend for the buy list demo tool. Let's take a look at it right here. I'm gonna be pulling it up. This is the buy list tool. If you are logged in, you head over to buy list and then you create a buy list offer and this is where it shows you what things are available for buy list. Honestly, this is a little bit hidden. I think that these buy list prices should be directly easily linkable off of any listing that you're looking at. But let's look at Snapcaster Mage here for a second. We pull up Snapcaster Mage and we see a bunch of people are gonna be offering to buy this card. This is very, very popular card on lots of buy lists. And the buy list prices that we're seeing range from about $35 on down. There's 104 people offering or offers to buy up to 104 uh, Snapcaster Mages, ranging from about $25 on up to $35.75. Now, how does this compare with other buy list prices? Well, one of the places that I often sell is Card Kingdom. Here's the Card Kingdom listing for Snapcaster Mage. The red here shows that it's a high priority to them. They're at the $32 in cash range and the $41.60 range for credit. So if you're just turning it around to throw it back into cards, you're actually gonna get a better price here. But if you just want cash, if you want to liquidate, with this one particular opportunity, several people are above that 32 mark. Now, how you're gonna deal with condition, reputation of those stores, that type of thing, that's still really to be determined. They've got some videos out on condition, which is gonna matter a lot when you are either making an offer to buy list stuff out or you're sending your own cards into buy list. 
What would be best though is, and this feature has not been turned on yet, but they plan to, is this market buy list price right here where it says coming soon. When that shows up, you're gonna then be able to see a spread between the market price and the buy list price. Those two metrics are two of the most important metrics for figuring out if something is actually selling, if there's value in it, or if the price is inflated. Prices in Magic go up really quickly, and then they slowly float down like leaves or feathers. You end up with these huge discrepancies between buy list prices and market prices that are cards that you want to avoid. Getting that information financially is going to be one of the biggest benefits out there to individuals who are interested in when to buy and when to sell cards. So I'm excited about where the feature is going. It's not fully implemented yet, but it is a big step in the right direction from TCG Player, giving us more transparent information and allowing us to be more informed consumers. A lot of people have asked, do we have a bubble right now in Magic Finance? And the answer is yes and no. There are certain cards with regards to the reserve list that have gone up that will not come down much, if any. There are other cards that have went up that the price may stay high, but nobody is actually going to want them. Nobody is going to buy them. A card like Lion's Eye Diamond is extremely powerful. It is basically a Black Lotus in many different decks. This card will not drop down in price much because of how powerful it is and how many decks it's played in. A card like Thanos' Coffin has a cool little ability to it. It's rare. Absolutely nobody plays it. Or they only play it occasionally in EDH. The cards to avoid that will get hit by a bubble are cards that are not actually played. The value of cards is based on how much they are actually played. We've got some really good Sage advice that came out of Chase Anders recently over at SCG. I've mentioned him in several of my other videos. Sometimes I'm critical, sometimes I'm positive. I only talk about this guy because he is one of the smartest guys out there in Magic Finance. Even when I'm critical, I respect his perspective. He has some good advice here, which is stop panic buying cards after spikes happen. Buyouts only work because someone is willing to pay more money for the card on the other side. Many of these cards that have been bought out, and there's a giant list of them, should not have gone up in value. They fall into that avoid bad category. And I can't go through every single card. If I was doing Magic Finance every day, I could, and I may do that at some point. But I'm hoping to give you a metric here to try to figure out if a card has gone up because it's been underpriced and people will want it, or if it's gone up because people know it's on the reserve list, they bought it up, and they know there's a limited quantity. This is a recent screenshot from the interest page over at MTG Stocks. Great resource out there. Lots of cards. All of these with those little stars by it are on the reserve list. Some of those are great, and some of them are terrible. On the great cards are Metalworker, Talarian Academy, Yava Maya Hollows. These are cards that are really powerful. We are unlikely to ever see anything functionally similar to them again. Yava Maya Hollows might be the exception there. I would hold on to these. I wouldn't liquidate them. Yes, the price went up. The price is going to come down a little bit, but not much. There are other cards like Island of Walk Walk and Altar of Bone. They have very situational applications to them. I would avoid them altogether. Retribution of the Meek is on that edge to me. It is a decent card, maybe even a really good card, a three casting cost board wipe in the right EDH deck, but it's also from Visions. There's lots and lots and lots of these in many different languages. I would hold it because it's a cool card, but I would not invest in it. There are a lot of bad cards on the reserve list. Many, many terrible cards. When I was a kid, I remember people buying False Orders and Dwarven Demolition Teams back when they had commons and uncommons on the list, and people lost a lot of money buying those cards because nobody ever wanted them. Cards like Imprison, Typhoon, Reverberation, Ghost of Dirk. These are bad cards that somebody can buy them all out, the price will go up, but nobody will ever want them except Sep builders and unless you want a complete set of legends there is no reason to own these cards they're just not good there's even some terrible cards narwhal spiked forecasting cost first strike protection from red two two terrible thought lash another bad card not only because it's barely playable 
but it's from a set where there's millions of them out there. Lots and lots of these sitting in people's basements. Nobody wants them. Invoke Prejudice. Not only a terrible card, but also one of the most offensive cards in all of Magic the Gathering. The artwork on there is truly offensive. These are cards to avoid altogether. So when you see cards from the reserve list, try to figure out how playable they are, how unique the ability is on them. Would you want them in a cube? Would you want them in your EDH deck? Are they played in top legacy or vintage decks? Vintage has very little effect on the value. Legacy has more effect. And EDH is one of the biggest pushers long-term behind these cards. I really, really toiled over whether to put this list out. I'm not trying to spike any of the cards on this list. I own between one and four of most of them because I play them in decks. But if you are interested in picking up some older cards that are playable, that will probably not drop back down in price ever, these are solid, playable, fun cards I would definitely look at trading for or picking. I'm going to talk a little bit more about standard, which is pretty exciting in the finance world. We've got standard moving very quickly, highs going very high, and lows crashing pretty quickly with the set rotation. And to demonstrate that, Quiet Speculation, who I'm really divided, they have some of the best articles out there and some of the worst articles out there, has a really wonderful article um, by Diego here. And it goes over where the money is and what happens to sets and which sets are retaining value after they crash. In your first few weeks of a set, all sets have this high value. A few months later, to a year later, to two years later, it is worth a very small percentage. He breaks down several different sets, including Shadows Over Innistrad, shows you where the value is and what has happened to those cards. This is the trend to be aware of in Magic Finance. And finding the cards that break this trend, that keep their value into Modern, that keep their value into Eternal, or that are playable through the entire season, is the key to doing well in Standard. Right now, I really like the aggressive aggro decks that are out there. Patrick Chapin did a wonderful article on Red Deck Wins recently. The Impervious Devils is a really interesting take on Ball Lightning, one of my favorite early cards. Exquisite Firecraft I've seen played in Modern, in Standard, and even in Legacy. It is a very powerful card. Collective Defiance also has potential to do four damage to creatures. I really like this. If you've got extra mana, this could be a great card coming up. I'm still working on my set review. Hope to have it out in the next day or two as release day is coming here. But I'll have a top 10 list for Eldritch Moon very, very soon. We've got some other cool cards in Standard that are starting to get a little more respect. And I would definitely still pick them out, even if they're going to rotate soon. Jermoka's Command will rotate soon. Great modern card. Ulamog, long-term kid favorite. Good competitive card. Slightly playable in modern. EDH powerhouse alternative win condition. And the monster here. Oh, so cool card. It is a lot of fun in EDH. It's seeing some standard play. This is a card that could see a wonderful green-black control deck take over the environment also. Modern prices are bouncing around. They're a little more stable than they have been. Quiet Speculation has another article that rightly points out there's some crazy buyout stuff going on, even in modern. Brusslands was at $18 recently. There's no reason for that. It's been printed a bunch of times. I would hold the Ice Age version because it's only 6 bucks, and if it does see play in modern, that's the Black Border version people will buy. The 10th edition is similar art quality neither is amazing to me but neither is bad i like them they're just not my style but i wouldn't pay 18 dollars for something when there's a black border original equivalent at six dollars painful truce this is a card that could be a breakout modern success as we see grand prix come up for modern and worlds at the end of the year this is a card that could spike river of tears spiked recently it's up at 11 dollars I personally really like this card, but I haven't been able to make it really win. I've seen some Grixis lists or other lists that will play this as a one or a two of as a way to help get around choke, but it is not an 11 or $12 card and it could be reprinted in the future. I would avoid cards that spike like this. Pack Rats, really fun card, great EDH card, solid modern card. 
fun brew card. Might even win a major event at some point. It's $2, the foils are 6 I would pick this up as a casual favorite card that has some long-term value to it. Modern Masters 2015. This is a set you should look at the staples, anything that is being played in modern decks, and look at buying them now. Dark Confidant is a prime example. This was a very expensive card. Now it's down around $35 to $40. Fan favorite, I do not believe this will be in the next Modern Masters set. A very solid pickup. If you want to play a set of these, or maybe even two so that you've got an extra one to trade, now is a solid time to pick up Dark Confidants. Conspiracy. This is another set that you should be looking at, and look at cards that combo with it very well. Exploration is down around $11 currently. Great card. I would pick up my play set. This is a wonderful EDH card, a great legacy card, very, very powerful. It works really well with cards like Thespian Stage, and I hear rumors that we're going to see Dark Depths very soon. If we do, Thespian Stage could go way up. Exploration could get more popular. These are the type of cards I would look for in finance. Eternal Masters. Your top tier cards have reached about their low point currently. Caracas, Sylvan Library, they're well below what they were before being reprinted. They could start to incline again. These are cards that I would definitely pick up. I'll have a longer list probably in about two, three weeks with some more mid-range cards. But over the next 30 to 60 days, Eternal Masters cards prices are going to be at the lowest they'll be ever. And many of these cards will start to rebound in value. Take a look at those lists, target what you want, and start picking them up over the next month or two. Commons. I'm going to do a whole video on commons here and cool cards, especially those that have potential value in Popper, but I'm just highlighting three of them today with regards to Black. Grey Merchant, Victim of Night, Call of the Netherworld. These are all potentially wonderful cards, both in Modern and in Popper. In Modern, discarding a Call of the Night to a Pack Rat, bring back something else from your graveyard, that seems like a really cool combination. Victim of Night in an Eternal format is a solid removal, especially if you're in Mono Black. And Grey Merchant, very, very powerful in any format where people are actually trying to kill you, where they're playing Burn, where they're trying to reduce your life total. That 2-4 body lives through a Lightning Bolt. Against a Burn deck, this is a powerhouse. If you're not dead on turn 5, you start to swing the game by playing one or two of these guys, and they're not coming back. Take a look at commons. There's a lot of potential value out there in commons. For magic finance advice that doesn't make you cry, this is Brian Rowe with Mythic MTG Tech. Subscribe to the channel. If you want to help me produce more videos, please become a patron to the channel. I've got a lot of plans, including going on the road. I'm going to be at Gen Con. I'll probably be at GP Portland. I want to produce more videos out there on the road, and I could use your help working towards a laptop and a portable GoPro. Those are my next two things that I'm looking at for the channel so that I can put together videos while traveling. Thank you to everybody who's out there supporting the channel. Next pack openings are on August 10th. The cards from the last pack openings are going out here in a few days. Uh, check your email by next Monday. If you got any of the higher value cards, you should have tracking information in there by then. Uh, thank you guys so much for being fans of the channel. And until next time, choose the cards wisely.